break up letter from his girlfriend just after having survived a bloody battle, or even worse, uh, that of the GI who uh, is informed that his beloved wife has died in joint birth. This is from the naked and the dead. Or as well, uh, sorry, the guy who never receives any letter, who has no uh, picture displayed from anybody, parent, girlfriend, or, or whatever. So, war, as a time of exception, manifests itself, among many other things, of course, by the fact that it puts together huge aggregates of men, of mates, gatherings which are supposed to be provisional and which are in their very principle artificial. That is, which are a challenge to so-called natural and social order based on, on uh, family life and spirit. What I would like to suggest today is that things are maybe not so simple, not exactly so simple, and that things can also be taken from different angles than this very correct one I have briefly summed up here. What the shot with the picture of the wife and the children signals is a typical Hollywood conformist stereotype. And we should not forget at this place that Hollywood is a manufacturer for conformist sense of meaning units. For there is something on which I think anthropologists from any kind of school can easily agree upon. Family, as this film referred to as a natural or universal model, that is, monogamous family with two children and living in the detached house, which is, as you know, the average American dream, family is something which has appeared only very recently in the history of mankind. Many other models of social organization exists, and in many of them, males aggregates or gatherings exclusive, exclusively masculine or male, separate gatherings that is male communities play a decisive role. They can be, these gatherings can be hunters or warriors, male societies, they can be elders, so-called elders councils in, let's say, primitive, so primitive societies, and elders council to rule the community. These gatherings, these main gatherings, have their special rites, their special celebrations, their customs, their rules, and which they, as a rule, do not share with women. And this mostly in so-called savage or traditional societies. According to many anthropologists, the figure of male community, Mendelman in German, because it comes basically from German anthropology, this notion, this answer. So male community or Mendelman is like a general archetype, archetype whose traces can be spotted not only in ancient and traditional societies, but as well in modern conditions. If we follow this track, we can suggest this. One cannot exclude that there is something a bit suspect in the constant insistence on the, let's say, family windward symptom felt by soldiers 
on the theater of operations in all these four films. I mean, there is maybe something a bit suspect in this film's insistence on the fact that homesickness and nostalgia for family, for family life, is or should be the most unanimously shared feeling among the soldiers from any rank and condition during that war. And here I'm talking before all about American films, even as they staged Japanese soldiers, and you, you will see uh, in some clips from Clint Eastwood's letters from Iwo Jima, how the spirit uh, of the Japanese soldier is uh, contaminated by this stereotype. In other terms, how the way um, Eastwood insists on the fact that these Japanese soldiers from any rank uh, also had pictures from their wives with them, also sent and received letters to their family. This is an evidence which shows that these people were not savages, were human like us, like us Americans in the so, okay, maybe we can see the first of the clips on the shot, the shot on the picture, the shot on the photo. So, first one is from a submarine film, I think, which is called Destination Tokyo, with Gary Grant, a film which was shot during the war, 1943. Uh, the filmmaker, Delma Davis. So just a brief, very brief, brief, just to see how it works, this shot. And this you can, it's, you can imagine, it's just, uh, it's a pattern. You can find this kind of picture in dozens of these pictures. Just to show that, okay, this Japanese are 
human beings like us. So, um, Lindestod insists on two things. One, uh, people who were able to sense or uh, touching moving letters to their family cannot be savages. This is one issue. The second issue is that uh, soldiers in this battle, Japanese soldiers from any condition, that is from the general, from the top, to the rank and file soldier, all of them had this kind of attitude, sending letters, uh, keeping the pictures of the family. So as a community, they have to be rehabilitated. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is the, the meaning of the film, and it's interesting to see how, among other things, of course, it goes through this insistence on pictures, letters. Okay. And, uh, okay, on this uh, chapter, Last thing, it's different, but still about letters. So it is from this very beautiful film by Terence Malick, uh, which is about a bloody battle in, I don't remember which island, um, between Japanese and Americans, uh, the thin red line. And it's at the end of the film, after the battle, one of the American soldiers who have survived receives this uh, letter from his wife, which uh, destroys him. And this is uh, very, uh, the filming of it is, is very clear. So, okay, there. Yeah. Okay, let's see. You think it's good? You find it good? No, it's just very terrible. Right. So, the way she writes the so you laugh because you don't want to cry. You said it's good. It's good. She has no consideration for what she is like. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. It's very direct. Jack, I fell in love with a guy. <laughs> no, how are you or whatever. I met the captain and I fell in love. The other guy is the Air Force. He's probably yeah, Soviet yeah. Marine. The point. I find it's beautiful. I like the acting too. It's not easy. It's very lost. Yes. Okay, so I I go on. Um, so okay, war. Um, war as uh, let's say let's um, take war into consideration or envisage war as a time of regression in terms of general terms of civilization, in particular civilization of the morals and the conducts. I read from here to uh, not that I guess uh, fundamental basic work, process of civilization. And okay, what I want to say here is quite basic and simple. War is a time as you can, you may, and very often you have to do all kinds of things which are not only strictly prohibited in normal peace conditions, but which are considered in peace conditions as crimes. It's not only killing, but all kinds of uh, you know, treating people, bullying people, looting, destroying, etc. So 
wall is, as a rule, a period placed under the sign of looseness, laxity in terms of conducts and behaviors. The many self constraints in our societies, the level, as Norbert Elias insists on this, the level of self constraints is very high for ordinary people, for individuals. So at the time of war, the many self constraints which are a condition for a human being to behave in a civilized, acceptable manner, these self-constraints become loose. They grow lax. And they, of course, more than often, they just collapse and dissolve. And I would like to come back, to go back to a scene from Raoul Walsh films, the Naked and the Dead, a scene we already have looked at, but I would like to present it again and to okay, insist on uh, interpretation in this uh, scope here. So in this scene, you maybe remember how uh, a non-commissioned officer from the Marine Corps, a very bad guy, uh, kills the Japanese prisoner, and this in a very poor, wide way, just obviously just for the pleasure of killing and feeling this way omnipotent. And then he asks one of the soldiers of this small unit to pull out the gold teeth from the Japanese soldiers who have been killed uh, as, okay, this very short uh, ambush took place. So in this scene, you find two very brutal, decivilizing actions. That is, killing the disarmed enemy who has surrendered after having <coughs> made him believe that he's safe. I think having looked at the picture of his wife, having set his mind at rest by offering him a cigarette and then uh, shooting him full blooded and this with a green or even a lot. And then profaning uh, profaning the dead bodies of the enemies by treating them as wrecks. Uh, and you remember here yeah, this place, God teeth uh, is uh, some sort of, of an euphemism for ears which uh, were cut from the Japanese uh, soldiers. Okay, let's see the film maybe now and then I will add something else. of the sea that is in the middle of the jungle, far from any institution that is far away from law. Uh, this jungle becomes a free killing area or a lawless deteriorator. And the perverse non-commissioned of this son is perfectly aware of this, so he knows that he can give free reign to his lowest instincts. He can get quite free and enjoy really the pleasure of killing. This is one aspect of war as the time of conflict exception. The transgression and profanation of the norms and patterns of civilized life become for him profit. And Buddhist fanatics 
of his kind. Uh, this always becomes some sort of uh, feast, a festive event, a parenthesis, not only in normal life, but as well in normal, even in normal military life, because normal regular military life is very strict and disciplinary. On such occasions, uh, a very ordinary man, my prophet, uh, meaning normal uh, civilian life, who is um, more than often prostrated, humiliated. This ordinary man takes his revenge and enjoys the power over life and death he exerts on the disarmed enemy, who is for him a human, a toy has become, a toy in his hands, is just worthless life. In such uh, exceptional conditions of war, in this, in this small building, as you saw, which is nowhere, uh, in the jungle, in the middle of the jungle, uh, cruelty, sadism, murder, can be associated with joy and pleasure. The reversion of civilized values and behaviors are, is then at its peak. But, and this is the second feature of this scene, such a thing can only happen in a context that is very distinct in terms of gender. This is, this is, of course, a typical, let's say, males here. Males are here by their own. The murderers are the microphone of the males community, men. No female witness or participant is the condition, this is the condition for this, let's say, innocent crime to be gratified at least at the time, Second World War, or it seems that things are slowly or rapidly, you know, changing on this angle. And we come here to what the pictures or reports we have from what happened in Iraq, uh, during the war in Iraq, and at this place, uh, at the time, where also women, US military women, were involved in torture uh, scenes. Okay, so what I mean here is quite simple. From an anthropological point of view, war, any kind of war, local or total, as uh, that war, more in the Pacific, um, war is a very ambiguous phenomenon in particular for men. It is, of course, constantly associated with terror, with horror, fear of the suffering. But, as well, it is associated with this very obscure pleasure to regress. That is, in individual terms, the pleasure to go white, to go mad, like an uncontrollable child. And if we put it in collective terms, the pleasure to go back to sensations, behaviors which have been suppressed, repressed by the development of civilization. One of the key states being here, of course, violence, that is violent feelings and conduct. In other terms, one of the best kept secrets of war, as it is depicted in ordinary filmic narratives, is this pleasure and positive feelings of all kinds can be associated with the regressive reconstitution of a community of men at war, a community whose collective and extreme violence is a shared origin horizon for all these men, that is the community for war 
and not only at war. The association of violence, that is violent behavior, act of killing before all, with power as a sensation, is at this place especially noticeable. War is what makes for maids diving in the heart of darkness of human lust for violence, extreme violence, a commendable or at least acceptable comment. So we will see on this a clip from Hell to Italy. Uh, you maybe remember we saw uh, some clips on this film. It's about it's a story. It's a biopic, basically. It's a, uh, about this guy uh, from uh, uh, Mexican origin, Chicano, let's say, origin in California, who is an orphan, uh, who in the film becomes a good American was often. Uh, his name is Guy Gabaldon. He has been raised in California by a Japanese, very loving Japanese-American family. And then, uh, at the beginning of the war, he is drafted at the very of soldier. He is brought into action uh, in Saipan, in the battle, very bloody battle on the island, on the island of Saipan. For obvious reasons, he is reluctant at the beginning to fight against Japanese soldiers. But after he has seen how his best friend, his buddy, is killed in a very bestial way by Japanese soldiers, he becomes, he runs amok and kills at random. It's like the wrath of an almighty god uh, who has got mad. So, Let's see this scene from El Kitan. Okay, so you see in okay. right now that killing has become a pleasure. So okay, let's go back to the, the picture of the wife and the children in the frame on the bedside or in the wallet. Uh, so, as I say, this shot, this picture, is uh, intended. All these films are reminding us that these men in uniform are at the place where they are. That is a uh, submarine, a trench, or a uh, shelter. Uh, on, uh, hospital bed, uh, they are at this, at this place to do their duty or because they have uh, as a consequence of uh, having uh, done their, their duty. And all these people are torn apart from their natural, alleged natural condition, which is family. Uh, they are basically, they remain family made which means that their fate, if they survive war, of course, is to go back to this position, to this milieu, family. So the picture is at this place to convey some kind of a subliminal message. When, as war will be over, after these men have done their best for victory. That, of course, maybe after having mentioned of the beaten tracks of civilized life due to the consequences of war. After all that, this digression, this parenthesis, will have to be closed. It has to be closed. And these men will have to go back to normal life with symbol once more whose core is family. They will have for this reason to stick to the normalized, authorized standard narrative of war, which is patriotic, which is moral, which is epic, which is heroic. 
and they will have to forget, consequently, they will have to forget the irredeemable part of the story. Uh, that, and this irredeemable part of the story is that where the soldier, who is basically the citizen wearing the uniform, who does his duty, uh, sometimes this soldier transforms himself into a warrior, a savage warrior, who has cast off what made of him a decent man, a well balanced God. So the insistence uh, on, in these films, on this picture, has a vocation to make us forget that modern wars give free reign to the civilized family man double or double finger. That is the exultant rabbit warrior for whom the community of maids fought again to savage life far away from family life and for whom the archaic maids community has been recreated as a provisional substitution for natural figure. So where he has become uh, the formalized guy who collects his dead enemies ears as just a souvenir to bring home. So as a matter of fact, the family pictures function is to link together two, let's say, two words, two spheres of life. But two spheres which actually, which in fact cannot communicate. They do not communicate with one another. They are completely heterogeneous. The sphere of war, the sphere of peace. And this non-communication situation is the subject of a British film, we will see a few clips of now, which is called Yesterday's Enemy, film by Van Van Gest, which was shot in 1959. This film is based, uh, as it is mentioned in the, the credits at the beginning, on, I quote, a war crime perpetrated by a British captain in Burma in 1942. So it's about a British platoon which is fighting the Japanese in the Burmese jungle at that very critical period of the war. That in the time as the Allies, uh, the, the British and the Americans fear that the Japanese invade, there is a threat, a possibility that the Japanese invade India and maybe they could join forces uh, with the Germans who are not so far from India at that time. So this unit is led by a captain called Langford, who is convinced he's a professional and is convinced that war has its own rules. That war is purely and simply terror. And that what matters is to defeat the enemy and this by all means. So, as a professional, his proton is authoritarian and he thinks that moral, moral or religious principles do not have to interfere, interfere with the conduct of war, and in particular, this kind of dirty war based on intelligence, bluff, intimidation, bad tricks, etc. This guy, this officer, is not sympathetic at all, but he does his job, and this in very unfavorable conditions. So, as you will see in the first clip, he doesn't hesitate to murder some Burmese or a Burmese Japanese villager and this in the boat to put his hand on his opponent's plant with a Japanese major who also commands a small unit in the unit in the jungle or a major or a Japanese officer called Major Yamazaki. 
And this plan, he wants to collect his of this is his importance for the high uh, command of the Allies, because he can save thousands of Allied uh, soldiers if it's disclosed in time. So, as you will see, Langford's philosophy of war is that one can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, and that, after all, a few natives' lives do not matter much in comparison with the strategic interests of this war. Some colonial lives have to be sacrificed so that many Western lives can be saved. As you will see in the second clip, Major uh, Yamazaki, his Japanese counterpart, sees things exactly the same way. So he shoots some British prisoners in order to make the others speak because he needs intelligence. So both officers, the British officer, the British captain, and the Japanese major share the same code of war. This in terms of relations between means and ends. They know that war is a time of exception which changes all the rules, all the patterns. For this reason, since they share the same code, they respect each other. The Japanese major says to Langford, you are the kind of enemy I would have liked to have on my side. And this is, if you think for a while about it, this sentence is a very paradoxical compliment because basically it means this. We are enemies, but not because we conflict about values on that is on basic moral ethics. We are enemies only because we conflict about interests. For the rest, we share the same values. For we both belong to the community of men at war. In other terms, hostility between these two officers from the two opposite camps can only be temporary. It is related to the conflict in interest in these special circumstances. The British captain and the Japanese major, for this reason, are not real or true and literate, let's say, enemies. Because true enemies or illiterate enemies conflict on values. They have nothing in common. They do not share anything. So this is the reason why the life force, the Yamazakis, can so easily be reconciled after the war. And this in spite of all uh, its horrors and cruelties. They have much in common. So maybe, I will see. Uh, these two clips, so, uh, no, this one, maybe this one later, uh, this one first. And then the other one on the page. So he's uh, the British captain is uh, uh, trying to know something, is interrogating this guy uh, who is basically he's a local native Japanese agent. He doesn't want to speak. So he has to intimidate him. Uh, and he, I mean, the, Japanese, the British captain does it in a very brutal way.
nothing special. We're all merging like this. Mm -hmm. We're all merging like this. This is British philosophy. Uh, Western made this place. So that's They're similar kind of symbolism or this picture showing like nation uh, Is there much the same thing in pictures that are shown like uh, probably when they make a film, they would also like have the same kind of uh, bias to make or they would make the uh, actors About torturing women. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, women torturing. Women torturing. Well, this one. Well, it's not Pacific War film. Yeah. I once heard heard of him in a lecture. Uh, it's about court film, and there's one. Uh, the the uh, the lecturer uh, introduces one film made by Shaw Brothers. It's called the Women's Concentrate Ch uh, Camp, yeah. and it's a setting is like a a Chinese some um, Chinese battlefield. And somehow there's a concentrate camp made by, uh, formed by the Japanese. And I don't know why they can get the uh, Western women and Chinese women into that concentrate camp and torturing them. And so, 
all kind of uh, uh, exploit that specific thing. So, in a way, there's it is interesting. It's made by Chinese uh, filmmaker mm -hmm. and really famous Shaw Brothers. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyways, uh, for your reference. <laughs> Say something um, now uh, to connect. Uh, okay, what we just saw from yesterday's enemy with the railway man. And okay, we finish on this before we pass to the presentation. So um, we could we could say maybe um, that the railway man, which is a very recent uh, uh, which was uh, released two, two years ago only, British 2, British film 2, um, we could um, take it into consideration as uh, some kind of uh, uh, postscript to yesterday's enemy on that issue, enemies which made enemies which have much in common. So I would like to develop a bit uh, this um, uh, issue. So um, you maybe remember in the Railway Man, which is the, this, the story of this former British soldier who was in a Japanese camp uh, in Thailand during the war, and he was very badly during his captivity in this camp and for this reason uh, he is unable to adapt to civilian life uh, after the war. He is uh, constantly obsessed by nightmares, uh, gloomy memories. We do not know at the beginning of the film what exactly what it is about, but we understand from his behavior that he has been traumatized. Uh, and, uh, okay, the story of the film, the plot, it's uh, just how this man, at the end, uh, becomes uh, one of his tormentors, a uh, very good friend. This is the story, this is the, the plot. He has tracked uh, down this uh, Japanese, former Japanese soldier who was a uh, okay, so-called translator but who was active in the tortures uh, which were uh, inflicted on, on him. So it's uh, the same issue because it appears at the end of the film against all uh, expectations that these two guys the one who was uh, the British soldier, who was tortured, and his uh, uh, torture or torment, uh, his people, these two men, as veterans, have much in common. So, I don't know if it's the uh, uh, intention of uh, the filmmaker or not, but this film, The Railway Man, also draws our attention onto this affinity between, between the two former and the Western victim, the Eastern uh, torturer. Uh, and this, uh, the film does it, uh, okay, we'll see, we'll see it from the clips, but he does it, uh, he shows these affinities um, by using different um, narrative devices uh, of days, if you want, and one of them being this, which I find quite interesting. Uh, at the end of the film, it appears that Lomax, the British soldier, uh, okay, uh, one of the things which make that the past cannot pass for him, that it which is the origin of the trauma, uh, which makes it impossible for him to enjoy a normal life. He has 
completely from life, but in spite of this, he kind of, uh, he's not sociable. Um, so one of the reasons for this is a torture which has been inflicted on him by the Japanese um, in the camp. And as we see, as we discover uh, in, the, in the film, this torture is just a variation on water water. And uh, at the time this film has been released two years ago, uh, the use of this kind of torture at the detriment of the so-called Islamist militants in Guantanamo and in other secret detention centers of the CIA, all this was very much publicized, discussed, and this all around the world. So we see how some kind of an exchange of circulation uh, takes place through this, the use of this kind of, let's say, detail in the narration. Uh, because in this context, um, the barbarity of the other, of the Japanese, the Japanese torture, this barbarity through or by the use of this kind of detail, this backlashes on the image of the Western people's uh, water holding uh, seems to be what they both, uh, one as Westerner and the other as the former uh, Japanese uh, barbarian, this seems to be what they have in common. And this, of course, in terms of uh, cinematic language, that is in the realm of associations, allegories, metaphors, symbols, uh, which uh, uh, are, okay, let's say, things which uh, are used, commonly used in movie making to, let's say, make sense of something. So, in the film, after Lomax has spotted his former tormentor who has settled down in Thailand as a guide for tourists on the location of the former camp and this in order to atone for the crime he has been involved in during the war to keep the memory of this crime alive. So Lomax decides to go there to that place from Britain and to kill him in order to get rid of his uh, nightmares. But as he faces his former uh, tormentor, Lagasse, uh, he changes his mind, you will see the clips. That is, he reenacts what was inflicted on him by putting his tormentor at his own place, inverting <coughs> the clips. He pretends to chop his arm. Uh, you know, it's very gory, you will see these scenes. He pretends to cut his throat. He puts him in a tiger cage where the Japanese warders, tormentors, used to keep their prisoners shut in the sun, uh, and which is a device which was used again uh, by the US Army and the South Vietnamese allies of the US Army. Um, during the war in Vietnam, which is another transfer of day, uh, let's say, between the conditions of the Second World War and another uh, theater of war of operations. Okay, all this means that Lomax, Lomax cure, this goes through by his becoming himself a torturer. He has to take the place of the enemy as a beast, and this being the way he can unload the burden of his unutterable suffering, something he has never been able to speak uh, about with anyone. And this is another way of confessing, of course, that uh, of showing that uh, as both former members of this main community for war, these two people 
have much more in common than we could imagine at the beginning of the film. But uh, what is rather paradoxical is that uh, on the other hand, Lomax lectures his counterpart, the Japanese uh, uh, veteran. He teaches him severely how to talk correctly about the crimes he has been involved in without evading the subject, without making use of uh, euphemism. Uh, Lomax insists that the Japanese culprit should say the whole truth, take responsibility for all that was perpetrated by the Japanese criminals in this camp. As a victim, uh, he feels fully entitled to demand that the perpetrator not only makes amends but accepts to speak about his crime in the terms the victim has chosen to use. It's a right, it becomes a right, a submission right. The Eastern culprit has to talk about his crime according to the rules which are set by the Western narrator, which is, uh, let's say, by passing exactly what today's Japanese rulers are so reluctant. So, um, okay, this is the general background of the film. So, to finish on that, Lomax's attitude, as he appears in all these scenes as very, uh, very self-confident Western narrator uh, in this situation, his attitude is completely inconsistent, and this is the interesting aspect of this. Because on one hand, he lectures his former commander, in the name of moral principle, in the name of the truth. Uh, and on the other hand, he has to barbarize himself and to put his steps in his counterpart step. And all this in a very uncanny way, and this in order to escape the curse of the trauma, which is, uh, at least the least you can say, uh, rather uh, not an orthodox way, uh, an orthodox way of doing things for somebody who is lecturing and uh, teaching or playing the role of a professor of law. Okay, maybe let's see. Yes, we we'll finish on this. Uh, this is from um, different clips, so not all from the same sequence that is as uh, the two characters, the, the British soldier, the, the British veteran, and the Japanese veteran meet in, on this location, uh, the place where the camp was, and, okay. Get the free pass 
Yeah. And also, it's as I call it to, 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 to the plot of the film. It's just uh, because he could track him mm -hmm. um, because uh, he was back in Thailand, so he, he heard uh, somebody who had visited the, uh, this museum that, okay, this guy is here, so okay, you could collect. Uh, but it's, it is from it's from uh, the real Lamarck memories, but uh, it's uh, it's not like that in real life. Let's say uh, they began uh, to exchange letters, and as he went there, all the story went to Kiev. It, it was it didn't happen this way. He heard that Nagase was there. He wrote him you know, on Sunday. And as he went, as Lomax went, uh, okay, the, it was already small. They had exchanged enough so that, okay, but for, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, for the dramatic effects, it has to be like that in the film. It's not of, uh, it's not very subtle, it's not a very taste, but it's, uh, it's a bad thing. <laughs> well, not next, I, I will get a demo of the course. It will not be next week. Okay, I will, I will say right now. Next week, we'll have a special session uh, because uh, one of the PhD students uh, at the institute called Philip Kaus from Czechia. Czech is so okay, Czech. I don't know how to say it. What do you say? Czech Republic. Czech Republic. It's a republic. Yes. No, it used to be a kingdom. Uh, Czech Republic. Okay. Uh, so Philip who is working on Vietnam, preparing a thesis on Vietnam, a specialist of Vietnam, I think he speaks Vietnamese too, will come and present us something, uh, uh, something on uh, Vietnamese cinema, uh, movie making, and war. Second World War, but also connected with, of course, other wars. And of course, the American War in Vietnam. So it will take uh, about two hours. It will present a lot of things. I think it's highly interesting. Uh, so okay, let's, 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 if, if you if you know people who are interested, you can invite them. So this will be next week. So and I will continue uh, on this topic: gender and uh, men's uh, base community. And war at war uh, the week after. Okay?